and welcome you all to the meeting. So we do have a fair amount to get through today. I'd like to spend the bulk of the time talking about the Safe Streets for All grant opportunity. We have a half an hour in the agenda for it, but I think if we go over that, that we can make it up in other areas. I think it's more important to have that discussion today. Um, other things we have on the agenda, uh, reviewing the crash analysis. Um, Lucy's going to take the lead on that one and show the work that she's been doing uh, over the last month. And then also just kind of give you an update on where we're at with the draft plan, um, what our proposed like layout slash organizational structure is for it, and like what we've done, what we haven't done, um, that type of thing. So without further ado, I think we'll just get started with introductions. We can go fairly quick. Um, I'm going to try a new thing today. I'm going to do two at a time, and I'll just facilitate it. So um, do myself and then Lucy. So Rick Harbison, planner at GPCOG, managing the Vision Zero project. Uh, and then we'll have Lucy and Belinda. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Lucy, data analyst at GPCOG uh, and working with Rick on the Vision Zero plan. And then we'll go Belinda and Bob. Hi, yeah. Belinda Ray with GP Cog. Happy to be here to uh, talk with you all today. If you have any questions on safe and streets and roads for all that Rick doesn't cover, but I think he's got it all covered. So I'm just back up. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Uh, all right, Bob and then Kurt. Yep, I'm Bob Skin. Bob oh, sorry, Bob. Bob. <laughs> Which Bob? What about Bob? Bob. <laughs> go ahead, Bob. Other Bob. Bob Ernest Town is your big island. I'm on the select board, chair of the select board out here. And uh, Kurt, just... and then the other Bob. <laughs> Kurt Altianic, that public safety director, Tommy Gray. All right, Bob and then Ann. Yeah, I'm Bob Skian, uh, director of the Office of Safety at Maine DOT. All right, Ann and then Deborah. Hi, I'm Ann Gass. I serve on the council out here in Gray. Deborah and Tony. Hi, uh, Deborah Smith, New Gloucester. I'm a, a community advocate for traffic safety. Tony, then Kathy. Hi, I'm Tony Ward. I am the town manager here in Casco. Kathy, uh, Kathy then Tom Josh. Yeah, Kathy Tombarelli, <laughs> town planner, New Gloucester. All right, Josh, then Alexis. Josh Bradford, chief safety officer, regional transportation program. Uh, Alexis, and then Patrick. Alexis Guy, uh, I'm the Healthy Eating Active Living Team Lead at Cumberland County Public Health. Patrick, I think you're last. Save the best for last. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Patrick Adams. <clears throat> I'm the Safety and Operations Specialist for Federal Highway, and I'm the Federal Grant Manager for this project. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Um, before we get into the Safe Streets for All discussion, I did have a couple of just like quick updates I wanted to share. The first is um, not super related to Vision Zero, but just wanted to mention it. Uh, we are having a housing summit on March 26 from 1 to 6 o'clock at Ocean Gateway in Portland. It's called Meeting the Regions Housing Challenge. Um, should be a really good event. I think we're, you know, in the, we've got a couple hundred folks attending. I think the governor is doing the opening keynote. Um, if you're interested in attending that, uh, registration is closed, but I think we could probably get you in. So, uh, if you are interested in that, just let us know. Um, on to more transportation -y updates. Main DOT is updating their complete streets policy. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, complete streets policy, it's a way to make sure that we're planning, designing for all uses on our roadways, transit, biking, walking, um, not just vehicles. Main DOT, they've had a policy in place for, I don't know, Bob, like four or five years now, and uh, they're now updating it and looking for feedback. Um, we adopted a policy last year. I know individual communities have adopted policies. I'm pretty sure gray as a complete streets policy, um, but just wanted to put it out there as an opportunity to be able to 
weighing on something. Um, and I think I can just put the um, link in the chat. There's a, it's a whole online um, presentation that you can then add your comments to. Um, more related to this project, uh, I gave a kind of like a mini presentation to the moving main network uh, a few weeks ago. They had a lunch and learn session that was focused on Vision Zero. Um, Paul Drenon was there. He does he runs Vision Zero Maine. So he gave a little bit of a background on what Vision Zero is. And then I talked about our specific project and um, uh, our upcoming projects with Vision Zero. Um, the Moving Main Network, if you're not familiar with it, it's a networking group. It's people who are passionate about improving access to transportation in Maine. Uh, I think they meet monthly. Um, so if, if you're interested in um, learning more about that, feel free to reach out. But it was an interesting meeting. It was good to hear about other Vision Zero projects too. Uh, there's, off the top of my head, there's a um, project going on in Lewiston, Auburn. There's one in Sanford. There's one in um, Bangor that's about to start. Uh, and then there's another one in Kittery. So it's a, it's interesting that to hear about other Vision Zero projects that are happening across the state and encouraging. Um, I'm giving another presentation next Friday for the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. They're doing a lunch and learn. Uh, that's from 12 to one. I think that's gonna be a similar um, setup with Paul is gonna talk about um, Vision Zero and then I'll talk about the projects that we're working on. Uh, and then just um, in terms of our public engagement with this plan, uh, the survey and the map are technically still open. We have about 280 responses to the survey that we worked really hard for. Uh, and I think we've got another 10 or so that we still need to enter in manually. Um, and then it was a similar amount of engagement, I'd say, with the interactive map. So we've kind of pumped the brakes on promoting the survey, feel comfortable with where we're at. But that said, if it's still open, so if you have a great idea of like, oh, if we add a survey link to this flyer, um, we could get a lot of you know people to take it, like feel free to um, pass those along. All right, that's it for my updates. Does anybody have any questions before we start in on Safe Streets for All? Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, never mind. I was gonna ask if we were recording and I see we are. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm attempting to share my screen here. Let's see. Hmm. I'm getting mixed up with all these uh, the different screens. You're seeing it as a presentation, but not as the uh, full presentation, correct? Mm, we're not getting it yet. Oh. How many screens do you have going, Rick? When you... <laughs> There's three in this office. Oh, that is confusing. <clears throat> Lucy, do you mind sharing your screen? Yeah, give me one second. Okay, how's that looking? Perfect. All right. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so Safe Streets for All, the notice of funding was released last month, and there's a lot to take in to talk about. Um, we've been reading up on it. They had an, a webinar uh, last week that we attended, uh, and we've talked internally and trying to figure out what the best approach is. Um, today, 
thought what we could do is uh, we could just provide some background and information about the grant, um, share kind of where we're at with our thinking and approach, and then open it up to discussion afterwards. And I invited Belinda. She has lots of experience um, leading the first Vision Zero plan, also putting together both grant proposals. Um, and then Patrick, feel free to chime in, correct me if I mistake, misstate something. Um, and I'll apologize in advance that these slides are fairly uh, text heavy. Um, but yeah, so we have, there's two different grant categories, planning and demonstration grants, implementation grants. Um, what we've learned is that implementation grants are very competitive. They're only about 25 given in the first round, maybe more for this, this round, but they're very competitive grants. They're um, for large, essentially for like large metro areas. Um, they are based on a formula or, or um, they use a screen um, for, <laughs> they use a formula to screen out um, projects. And the formula I believe is like fatalities per vehicle miles traveled or something. At any rate, there's very few places I think in Maine that would be competitive, like using that formula. Um, Lucy, feel free to <laughs> jump in. Um, I think I got that right. Um, but yeah, so Biddeford applied last round for an implementation grant, um, and they had some good projects in there. I think it was like five or six million dollars worth of projects. Um, they're in an equity zone. They did not get it. So I think our chances of getting an imp implementation grant are pretty slim. Um, the planning and demonstration grants have a much higher success rate. So what we learned is that they that program was undersubscribed in, in FY23. And then those funds got rolled over into FY24. Uh, and in the previous year, every eligible project that had a complete application received funding. So I think that's a pretty encouraging bit of news there. Uh, there are three deadlines for the planning demonstration grants. April 4th is probably a stretch for us to get that in time, but there's May 16th and August 29th. Um, and then you can reapply if you're not selected in earlier rounds. So if we did a May 16th application, we could reapply in August. Um, and then there's three categories for planning demonstration grants. There's action plans, demonstration projects, supplemental planning activities. Um, action plan is what we're doing now. So I think for us, we would be looking at demonstration projects, supplemental planning activities. Um, in terms of who is the grant for, who's eligible, we did learn that it's for those who are in the process of developing a safety action plan and want supplemental planning before the plan is finalized. So I think that's key for us because it gives us some wiggle room with the deadline. Um, I, I was under the impression that we needed to have our action plan done in order to apply for additional funds. But um, what I'm inferring is that it's okay if our action plan is not completed, it's that we're in the process, we're working on it. Um, so I think that gives us some some good flexibility to um, kind of extend our deadline likely for the plan, but um, help with figuring out um, other opportunities here. Okay. So we learned they are encouraging multi-jurisdictional groups to apply. Um, if that's the case, then there's only one primary applicant, essentially it's the lead, and they are the ones that are in contact with USDOT. Uh, and that municipalities that are covered under our Vision Zero plan will just need to coordinate with us, and they would need to have a letter showing that um, we know they're applying and that their project would inform our action plan, is my understanding. So Rick, I just I'm confused about that. Could could you just clarify? I mean, so are you anticipating that some municipalities may apply separately under this Vision Zero plan? Then, 
as opposed yeah. to a regional application that that GP Cog would submit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'm gonna lay it all out for you, and then I'm gonna give you our our proposal for an approach. But we there's a couple different approaches that we could take. Rick, I want to toss something in here as well for Anne or any other community that may be considering applying. It's crucial that you coordinate your application with uh, with GP Cog Packs because no municipality can submit more than one application at a time. So if a municipality submits a grant application and GP Cog submits an application for that community, I don't know the exact results, but I'm guessing it could result in one or both of the applications getting kicked out and not even considered, so. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I I wasn't uh, we weren't thinking that we were going to apply necessarily. I, I my impression was it was going to be GP Cog's application. So uh, I you know I just I but I heard Rick say something different. So thank you for clarifying that. Well, and I understood that, and I just yeah. wanted to make sure it seemed like a really good segue to make sure I put that out there. For yeah, everybody. it's important. Coordination and collaboration is important. Yep. Um. Yeah, and. I'm going to get to that, Anne. We have, we have a couple different ideas for how we can approach this. Okay, so this is from the NOFO eligible activities under the two different grant programs. So um, there's a lot to go through here, probably too much for this um, meeting today, but under each grant category, there's these individual headings. Um, under each of those headings in the NOFO, they have lots of different examples of different types of projects. Um, so I just highlighted here the ones that seemed like potentially relevant. Um, for demonstration projects, feasibility studies, um, that's basically demonstration projects, like as you would think of them. So, um, you know, planters, temporary speed humps, um, using bollards, tightening intersections, enhancing crosswalks, it's it's demonstration projects. The manual on uniform traffic control device engineering studies, that one sounded initially to me like very technical and maybe out of our league, but under the examples they give, it's, you know, general application of roadway signage, um, evaluating warrants for traffic signal installation, mid-block crosswalk installations. There's some Good examples here of things that could work in our region. Um, behavioral or operational activity pilot programs, that's uh, new education campaign messaging, um, piloting a safe routes to school program, um, among other um, examples. And then new technology pilot programs, um, speed safety camera installations is, is one that jumped out for me. And then also they mentioned adaptive signal timing. For supplemental planning activities, the top two action plan updates, that's if you have a really old action plan or over five years. Action plan consolidation, I don't think we would necessarily need to do that. Um, complementary safety plan development would be some examples they give were additional complementary safety plans focused on topics such as speed management, vulnerable road users, accessibility for people with disabilities, um, lighting plans. So there's a lot you could potentially do there. Um, road safety audits, follow-up data collection and safety analysis. You can do um, roadway safety related inventories such as sidewalk inventories, road user counts, um, bike pedestrian counts. Uh, progress reporting would be kind of reporting vision zero project progress. So using like data dashboards, funding to do like annual reports on how we're doing. Uh, stakeholder engagement and collaboration. I kind of feel like we've we've done that, um, and we're at a different point in the project. But I, you know, open to that as well. Uh, roadway safety planning. This one I think is kind of a catch-all. They're 
description underneath is other roadway safety planning activities that enhance or inform the action plan. So I think there's, um, yeah, like long story short is that there are a lot of potential projects to um, that are covered in this grant. Uh, and then what the USDOT is looking for is really just like clear, comprehensive feedback loop with the plan. They want to know that the results in impact the plan. Um, and you really can't apply if you have no intention of informing an action plan. For the demonstration projects, they want to see that the demonstration projects kind of inform the list of projects or strategies that are in the action plan. And then you would have a final deliverable that's um, kind of an overview of what you did, a before after study, uh, and then updating the plans list of project strategies. For supplemental planning activities, it's done in service of developing a more robust action plan. And then the deliverable is some sort of publicly available report document that serves as a supplement to the action plan. Um, they also gave the example of like a streets design, complete streets design guide, or um, or you just updating the Vision Zero action plan with whatever the activities were, if it's still a work in progress. Uh, and then I think the next slide is different examples from last round. And so, so we just found these on the, the website. The Colony New York one is a really large one, but um, added it in here because it is an example of a joint application with multiple towns. They looked at technology around um, police and EMS um, communication. And then the Warwick one uh, and the West Bend one are both a little smaller in size, like closer to what we would probably apply for developing a safety action plan, uh, pilot slow down Warwick campaign. Um, updating action plan, conducting speed studies, road safety audits. So they bundled a, a couple different things uh, in their application. And then these were just some ideas that we were bouncing around of different projects that could work in our region. Demonstration projects, we were thinking mainly around like the village areas, um, there you can have installed temporary raised crosswalks, um, probably lots of opportunities for intersection improvements, um, crosswalk enhancements, temporary bike lanes. They also mentioned speed feedback signs, so you could um, potentially get funding for um, purchasing speed feedback signs. Uh, and then adaptive signal technology would be probably a more expensive proposal um, updating or upgrading traffic signals. Uh, supplemental planning activities, we, you could potentially do intersection studies, like looking at the two-way to two-way intersections in the region and what are the opportunities for converting two-way to always stops, um, looking at opportunities for roundabouts in the region. Mini roundabouts are kind of a new um, countermeasure, I'd say, or uh, new treatment for intersections that seems to be working very well. Uh, you can do road safety audits, um, AI camera technology. We are piloting a, um, AI camera sensors at Allen's Corner this year. It's not that expensive. It's around $15,000. Um, so that's something that we potentially look at. Um, bike pedestrian counters, that's included under the grant. So you could install like permanent bike pedestrian counters. Uh, and then an, another idea would just be to look at where the rumble strips are in the region, which we do have a, a data point for, um, and looking at like where are the gaps in rumble strips and sort of doing a feasibility study of um, what the opportunities are there. So that's not a comprehensive list at all, but just like some ideas that uh, came to mind. So what we're proposing is that currently like we are pretty much at capacity with our existing grants, with our existing staff. We have round one funding that we're using for developing this plan. Uh, and then we received round two funding for a demonstration project um, that's just starting out and that's an $800,000 project. Um, so that's taking up quite a bit of time. Um, our thought was 
that the communities can apply as subregions. So the Lakes Region communities could um, apply together, potentially like Gray, New Gloucester, Pownall, Durham could apply together. It would require one community to be the lead applicant and that we could use our existing Safe Streets for All funds to help communities identify the projects and prepare the grant applications. Um, the implications of that, I think that's the next slide. So just thinking through like some of the barriers, implications, um, challenges, um, finding a lead applicant with the capacity to manage coordinate a federal grant. So there are some reporting requirements there. 20% um, local match is something to consider as well. So it's a minimum award of $100,000. So, you know, $20,000 split four ways would be 5,000 each, um, but it would be a different story, number of communities that apply. 25,000. Um, just... Go ahead. 25,000, not 20. Oh, thanks. Oh boy. Is this recording? <laughs> it is. Um, okay. Anyways, um, coordination. So finding the, the right projects um, and just meeting that deadline. And then if we did that approach, you know, the implication would be likely that we would need to extend the timeline of our action plan and shift gears a little bit in like less of our time focused on developing the action plan and more of our time focused on helping you all identify projects, um, put together a grant application. Um, and then, yeah, we would just need to get started soon. And um, I think to get that done, we would need to start meeting in smaller groups um, and probably very soon to try and figure out um, like what the what a grant proposal looks like. So that's that's my uh, that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, I think that's all I got, right, Lucy? Is there another slide? Yeah. So I think with that we can open it up for questions, discussion. Can I just add one thing on our capacity, Rick? Yes. And um, and the reason that we are feeling at GPCOG like we cannot be the lead applicant on a third round. And that is, as Rick said, because we did get a grant in the first round and the second round. The one from the second ground round is going to require a lot of staff time and management. And we also um, applied for that grant as GPCOG. And because these regions will have an action plan in place. Some of the activities that we can do, not the demonstration projects, because we have we have uh, locations we're looking at within the PAX region, but some of the studies that we are doing are definitely beneficial to the entire region. So we do see the entire region benefiting from the grant we have just received. And while we're managing that, um, we just don't feel like we can go for a third round and manage another large grant in another 12 uh, municipalities at the same time. So that's, I just wanted to say that about our capacity. And I did want to emphasize that the work that we are doing with the current grant will be beneficial to our rural and island communities as well. Thanks, Belinda. Uh, Anne. Yeah. Um could you just walk us through the, I understand the deadlines for the grant application, but uh, based on your previous experience, how long is it before we get a response? Uh, you know, we've, we learn whether or not you've been awarded and then uh, what is, is it a one year, two year, three year kind of a time frame for implementation? So from when you apply, our turnaround time in terms of announcements has typically been, what, five to seven months before the announcement comes out, I want to say. So the first year we applied in September, we found it in, out in like February 1st that we were getting the grant. And then the second year, the deadline was July, and I think we heard in January. So, so it's like somewhere in that five to seven month. 
Then once you know that you have the award, you go through a process to get your agreement signed, and that can take some time too. We're currently working through that with Patrick. Um, so yeah, we found out in you know February, March or something this year, and or I guess, and, and so we're still working through that process. We think that we will have probably the agreement signed and funds ready to flow by what, June 1st, we're kind of looking at, Patrick. We think that's realistic. I think that's realistic. Yeah, so it does take a while. So so you, you have time to kind of um, prepare yourself. You know, it's not like you're going to apply and then you have to start working to get something active tomorrow, there is time. And then in terms of carrying out the activities, if you apply for an implementation grant, you have five years. Uh, and I guess you have five years with a demonstration grant also, but they would really like you to consolidate that time frame and finish it as quickly as you can so that when you report your results and share them, everybody can benefit from seeing what strategies you tried, how it impacted safety, um, and it becomes a, a learning process for, for a larger community. Does that answer your question, Anne? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. What's uh, different this year, Anne, is having the three application deadlines this year, that's a whole new strategy this year. One of the question marks I have is how long it will take them to review those applications, make a determination, and get the results published and out to the public. The theory that you can, if you don't get funded, that you can reapply, I think is presumptive on the fact that they turn that around fast enough. Maybe. I'm not. I, if you apply in the first application, you might be able to get it in by the final application. But if you do the middle one, I am not 100% confident it will be, you'll, you'll know the results oh, in time right. for the final application. I could be entirely wrong. Nobody has told me either way. That's just my gut speaking. I mean, I, I can't speak for the counselor, for the manager uh, here, but um, I, I think that it's likely we'll have some interest in applying um, and possibly with New Gloucester. I know that our, our new manager has uh, met with a New Gloucester manager um, recently and and, um, and they're interested in exploring ways of working together. So uh, we, we can... Um, think about trying to put together I mean we're it's, we're in the middle of budget season which makes everything crazy and we have a new town manager so poor guy he's uh hustling but um right. yeah so uh I don't know what sort of bandwidth everybody will have and we did get a CDS uh you know congressionally directed spending uh earmark for uh Libby or some a public safety project on Libby Hill Road that has to do with sidewalks and crosswalks and things so uh you know, still waiting for that shoe to drop and see, you know, like what process we have to go through to get that. So I'm just, uh, and of course, we're we're hoping to apply for a raise grant for our village project later this year. So it may be just too much. Mm -hmm. I will say, Anne, the application for planning and demonstration projects is not onerous. Oh, okay. There are definitely some data points that you need that that our team would be able to help you out with. We did that for Biddeford last year. We gave them the data they needed for specific pieces. Um, and, you know, there's there are other couple, couple of other things we can supply for you pretty easily. But the narrative on this is limited to two pages. They're allowing you an extra page this year. <laughs> um, but if if you want to add something else, but it's very specific, the questions you have to answer. It's it's tough to fit everything into two pages, but it's really not an onerous application. And you've written grants and you know how bad they can be. <laughs> and this is not a bad one. Two, three pages is, that's like, uh, I don't know, candy. Yeah, and that's mm -hmm. the bulk of it. That's And then you just have your budget, which is like one page. Um, yeah, and the federal forms. So sure. that seems very doable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
the application is one thing, the implementation is another, um, but it, you know, we wouldn't have to worry about it for a little while. And, and, uh, right. and I, I think, I mean, I, I, again, I'm just sort of, this is really off the top of my head without thinking about it a lot, but I, uh, you know, we're, we've been talking about more um, camp, you know, speed feedback cameras, um, mm -hmm. uh, other, you know, experimenting with stuff We're we're going to, I mean, we've been talking about this for years, but we actually are going to do, I think, um, uh, kind of a tactical urbanism uh, little project in, in Gray Village this summer, July and August. Um, so we'll, uh, but but those sort of testing different things could could work well for us as well. So uh, can you just actually, under the supplemental planning activities, you had mentioned an AI camera technology and I didn't know what that meant. Yeah, so that's a pilot project that we're doing this year with a company called Viva City, and they have um, cameras that you know record an intersection, and then they use AI algorithms technology to record not just turning movement counts and stuff like that, but also near misses oh. um, and potential crash scenarios, uh, particularly with um, bikes and pedestrians. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So yeah, I think it it'll be interesting. They're they have the cameras and they're going to get installed in the next few weeks, and then pretty soon we'll be up and running with the dashboard where you can see, you know, like what's going on, what the patterns are. Well, I will know more um, in the months ahead of you know what that looks like, but um, I know a lot of large cities have them at. Like New York's, the company that we're working with has a contract with New York City and they're London based too. So they also have cameras all over London, but they leave them up at the intersections um, all over the city uh, just to like track, you know, what's what's happening, where are their potential crashes occurring. So. And those are permanent installations as opposed to something you might move? Um, you can move them. So our proposal is to do it at Allen's Corner um, in Portland this year and then move it to Scarborough next year. And it, it like requires a little bit of work. Like it's, you know, you have to have an electrician from town um, public works to like, you know, set them up. But so it's not like you just have a quick release thing, but it's it's doable to move them around. You just wouldn't want to do it more than like once a year. Right. That's that's very interesting. Thank you. Yep. Um, I'll also add for anyone who is interested in potentially applying. I went to the a webinar um, last week on applying for the um, uh, demonstration and supplemental planning grants, and it was really comprehensive. I mean, we tried to cover a lot of it in here, but they got a little bit more into like the application process in that. Um, and it is recorded and the slides are up on the Safe Streets for All website now. So I would highly recommend. Yep, and I would just wanted to add that even though it says that the minimum is 100,000, they will entertain less than 100,000. And what you have to prove to them is that the amount you're asking for is enough. The reason they would reject it is if they say, well, that's ridiculous. You're asking for 60,000 because you don't want to have to match more, but that's never gonna finish your project. And in that case, they would reject it. But if you ask for the money and it's a reasonable scope, then you would be considered. And I, I scanned through the winners from last year and there are many that were 80,000, there's a 60, there's a 72. So people did go for lesser amounts and get them. So that is a possibility too, if an individual town wanted to apply on its own, that is probably a possibility as well. Oh, and finally, the match is allowed to be in kind, but you have to you have to document that well. Yeah. The feds giveth and the feds taketh away. Kathy, do you have a sense of for New Gloucester, like if that's something that the town would be interested in? 
I, I think that they're definitely interested. Once again, it's a capacity question. I would love to work with Gray if we could come up with something that um, we could be a multi-jurisdictional application and we could work on it together with support, like someone with like someone with Anne that's done this before. Um, I've certainly have written some grants, but um, if we could work together and come up with, I think speed on Lewiston Road is kind of an obvious um, commonality that we have. Um, I don't know if there's anything on 26, but yeah, I think that there is the desire to do it. We would just need to work together to make okay. it happen. And I think there's support in the community. Kathy, for sure. and Deb, I, why don't I, um, I'm going to check in with Mike and then I'll, I'll loop back to you guys and, and, um, and we'll see if we can set something up. We can send you the materials, so the, the NOFO and the webinar link and, um, Happy to help any way we can. Yeah, yeah. if anyone decides to apply, please do let us know. We can write a letter of support that you know states that you're definitely covered by our plan. We can help you with the checklist you need to show that you have a plan. Um, and uh, yeah, we're happy to help do whatever we can do. I know that Mike did watch the webinar last week because he sent me an email about it. And um, oh, wow. so, uh, you know, I think he's interested. Tony, I, I know you have a camera off, but if you're there, just curious uh, from the town of Casco's perspective. I'll tell you, I'm mute also. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't see us right now the capacity to look at it right now. I mean, we're doing some preliminary work you know, locally, but I, for a long, right now, capacity wise, we wouldn't be able to do it. Okay. All right. And I know I keep piping in and saying like, this is the last thing I'm going to say, but there are two more years of this grant, That's right? True. So yeah. keep that in mind also, if you really don't feel ready right now, um, or if you apply and don't get it, there's, there's supposed to be one in 25 and 26 as well. All right. So I think the thing to do then would be for us to, in a follow-up email to this uh, meeting, we'll send out the materials. We'll make sure we follow up with you and Kathy and um, Deborah. And then I think I'll just make sure I contact all the town managers and just, you know, do due diligence, make sure that, you know, Jason in Naples or um, Bob in Bridgeton are just to make sure that you know, they either do or do not want to apply. So, and we'll take it from there. Any other questions on this one? All right. Thank you, Belinda. Appreciate it. Thank you. Fun to be back in the Vision Zero world for a little bit. <laughs> All righty. Um, I am going to take it away with our next section, uh, which is reviewing our crash analysis and mapping. Last time I went over what we would be doing, but um, hadn't really gotten into it. But now I have sort of the results of what we've done and um, our pre preliminary uh, critical safety intersections and corridors to show you. Um, so um, I had talked about this last time, but as a review, there's sort of four parts um, to our analysis that informs those critical safety locations. So first we have our high injury network, um, which is just looking at historically where have crashes been the most concentrated. Um, we then have the high risk network, which looks at infrastructure and demographic factors um, and uh, how they're associated with crash rates to try to determine where crashes are likely to occur in the future. Um, we have our community concerns from both our online engagement, in-person engagement, stakeholder engagement, um, as well as I think there's some things from social media on there, um, but to try to inform places that might not be showing up on the crash map, but that community members recognize as um, dangerous places. 
um, either for driving or walking and biking. And then finally, we have our equity layer as well. Um, so with all of those, I made this dashboard um, that we're going to take a peek at. Um, and this is accessible to all of you. Um, I've sent the link and we'll resend it as well. Uh, so this has all of those layers that I was talking about. If you hit this over here, you can um, choose which ones show up on the map. On the left here, there's a description as well of um, you know what each of those layers are and sort of how um, how we're using it in the plan. Um, I'll briefly show that. Um, so our first one is the high injury network. Um, so those areas that are darker are the sort of uh, road segments with the highest scores, so the most dangerous. Um, and the high injury network accounted for, it was 12% of the roads in the region were on the network and 60% uh, of fatal and severe crashes occurred on those 12% of roads, which is pretty, pretty significant. <laughs> um, so it's uh, a good way to help us focus in on areas that might need uh, more work and we're, we'll be able to make uh, a greater difference with um, fewer resources. Um, moving on to the high risk network. Um, so the, the dark red is sort of the highest risk score than the pinkish, then the orange, then the gray. Um, and that looked at uh, number of lanes, speed limit, functional class, level of congestion, and population density. Um, and if you click on a road segment, um, you'll see attributes about the road, as well as sort of the score that it received. That probably wasn't a great example of one because it <laughs> didn't have any of those high risk attributes. Um, there's a lot to explore on here. Um, and then our community concerns, there's two uh, parts to it. There's the heat map, which is not showing up. <laughs> uh, oh, it's just, it's coming slowly. Um, and then there's also a point map. I'm so sorry, my internet is uh, not working with me today. This always happens when you go live. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, anyways, there are, are community concerns on there. It'll work on your computer. <laughs> um, and you can click on those as well to see like what the concerns actually were. Not all of them have details, especially if they were from our paper maps from our in-person activities. Um, but um, yeah, there we go, it's showing up now. Um, but you can see like what mode um, and like the type of concern and um, the comments that were made. Uh, so it's pretty it's pretty useful and interesting. Um, and then finally, all of that came together for our critical safety locations. Um, we do also have some background layers here, schools and um, uh, priority centers that can be interesting to look at um, in combination with the other layers. Um, so this is Rick and my uh, initial attempt at sort of putting all of that data together um, to highlight uh, priority areas. And we want your input on this. Um, I don't know how we're looking on time, Rick, if that input is better done now or maybe in a follow-up via email. I think we're doing okay if folks wanted to ask a few questions. I think ultimately we'll probably need to like have a period of time where you guys can look at it on your own and 
get back to us. But if there's anything that you want to explore right now or um, questions at the moment, I feel like we could happy to hear it. So I'm just wanting to make sure I understand that this this is it, these are data that you'll include in the whatever the report or plan the final plan and so they'll be uh, will they be um, you know will you separate them out by community uh, in the in the report or plan? Oh uh, yeah, that's a good question. So in the last plan we did a similar process. We had each map in the plan. So like high injury network was a feature map in the plan. We had each of them individually. And then we had the critical safety corridors as the last map. Um, in terms of like how they're presented in the plan, it's, I don't know, it might be difficult to put this onto one page. Um, like for the last plan, we had the whole region as a map on a page. Um, that's fine, Tony. Thank you. You, we could potentially do a map of the lakes region areas, a map of, you know, the New Gloucester area if we felt like it needed to be more focused. Um, and then, like the implications of the critical safety corridors intersections, is that it would help guide future work. So if you know, thinking about the Safe Streets for All grant, you know if looking at demonstration projects, future future supplemental planning activities, like they would likely want to see that those happen on areas that were identified um, through this process. And it's a little, um, there's no like perfect way to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's not like a, do you take the four maps and press enter on some computer program and it can spit out the critical safety corridors. It's a little bit of eyeballing it and making some decisions and like using our professional judgment, but it also, you know, it's, it also could use help from people who live in the areas as well. Like, you know, part of that's in there as community concerns, but uh, you know, you all as being on the advisory panel and having a lot of lived experience in these communities, like if you had, see things that um, feel like um, doesn't make sense or needs to be added or subtracted, um, definitely like open to those uh, suggestions. I have a question. The, um, what are the, do the little circles does uh, indicate on this map that we're looking yeah. at? Yeah, so the circles are are critical safety intersections, and then mm -hmm. the black lines are the um, critical safety corridors. Okay. And I'm sending a link to um, this dashboard in Great. the chat. So there were sections here like route 302 where there were like gaps in between and Lucy and I kind of made the decision to do the whole thing since it seemed like it would be better to just have a comp like a connected corridor um and we did that in a few other places too um but if you look at the high risk network that it shows up on the high risk network as being um, fairly high. So we kind of just uh, did our best to incorporate the four different data sets and like come up with what we were seeing as um, the areas of overlap and, and where those priorities would, would be. I mean, this definitely looks useful. I appreciate you, the work that you put into it. And I, I think, it, like you said, it'll be helpful for guiding sort of future planning and as, and also resource development. Yeah. Whether it's this streets grant or something else.
All right. Um, well, if folks don't have any comments now, um, we will make sure that everyone gets the link to this um, and has an opportunity to um, spend some time looking at the critical safety locations and give us some, some feedback. Uh, uh, Lucy, yeah, the link in the chat, it's not letting me um, hmm. access it. It's saying I need like login info. Okay, I will make sure that it is uh, publicly shared. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um... Okay, I can try and share my screen again. <laughs> Uh, it's going on. Is that coming up for you guys? No. No. Oh, there it is. Nothing? Yeah, good job. All right. So this is our draft outline for the plan. Um, and this is in our Google Drive folder. Um, the so I'll just start from the top. So we've got just put like little placeholders for where the cover page is, table contents, that type of thing. Um, we'll have our introduction. We've drafted that. We have a letter from the GPCOG Executive Committee that we have a draft of. Um, we're going to have a section on Vision Zero and the Safe System approach. So just explaining what Vision Zero is, what the Safe System approach is. Um, one of the challenges that like kind of uh, struggle with a little bit with this plan is like we just did this for another plan previously. So we don't really want to just copy paste what we did in the last plan. So I think for this section, for this plan, our thought is like keep it pretty brief about what Vision Zero is and what the safe system approach is, and then um, expand a little bit on what the challenges it challenges are with rural roads and how rural roads are different um, and use and like have that be the approach for this section. Uh, community engagement and public participation, it's pretty much drafted. Um, you know, we'll make tweaks as we get more survey responses, but for the most part, that's been written up. And then L Lucy has done a lot of the legwork here on the crash analysis. Uh, I think Lucy drafted a drafted it up. We just need to, you know, put the uh, graphs and visuals into the plan. Um, this next section I wanted to talk about with you all. So, in the first plan we did, we have this. Can you guys see that? Okay. Okay, so we have this section called tools and strategies. So this is right after we've kind of identified what the priority, the critical locations are. And then we have a section where we talk about what are some ways to improve them essentially. And so what we did in the previous plan is we had a what work section, and then we had a pretty long list of all the different countermeasures, which are essentially like safety treatments, um, a description of them, and then little icons for where they're best applied. So we had about um, a couple pages of these, and then we had local examples um, where those types of countermeasures have been applied. Um, Along the same vein of, you know, what we were talking about before, what I was talking about, is of, you know, not wanting to do exactly the same thing as the previous plan. What I thought about doing is organizing this section around what we've heard from the survey. So we had a couple questions in the survey that um, were open ended that were, you know, what, what is the, what is your idea for improving safety in your community? It um, wasn't exactly that language, but and we got some really good responses. We went through, we tagged all the open-ended responses um, by topic. And my thought was that we could organize this section around what are the top concerns that people had that we heard. Um, and then for each of those 
topic areas or concerns, we would have um, probably a data point, um, either location of where those concerns exist or something else related to it. Um, we would show potential solutions and then even local examples if there are some in that topic. So topics that uh, rose to top for us looking at the survey were safety concerns in the village centers and schools, um, really looking at walkability, um, being able to bike, uh, be able to get places within those, those uh, villages and downtowns. We could include, as far as data, we could include the location of the different village centers and schools in the region. Um, dangerous intersection was another one that uh, rose to the top. Um, and for that, we could show location of the intersections, um, like particularly focusing on the intersections that are two-way that could potentially be four-way um, or um, just having uh, enhanced like traffic signal um, enhancements, <laughs> traffic signal uh, improvements. Uh, dangerous straightaways, that's something that has come up. Um, like a lot of these long straight sections are actually like pretty high crash um, prone because people speed and um, go off the road or um, you have a front end crashes. So I thought we could show location of rumble strips on that as a data point. Um, dangerous curves would be another one. There's several da dangerous curves we could highlight. Um, narrow roads came up, uh, essentially like roads that are very narrow, no shoulders. So we could map out um, where in the region there are exist roads that have no shoulders. And then uh, speed management was a, a big concern as well. Um, for that, we, we do have a map showing speed limit data. And then I think we could probably um, just well, you have a discussion about how speed limits are set. I know Bob is working to revise how main DOT does speed limits, but um, they, we could kind of focus on um, speed for a, one of those focus areas. And then possibly something else uh, if uh, folks have ideas. I know there are a couple of cross-cutting things like lighting that, um, you know, you could put in the village area section or you could have it at its own topic. So um, some of those things would, re would require a little bit of decision making. Um, and then lastly, before I open it up, so taking action, that'll be actions and strategies that we have really not gotten to yet, um, but that'll be you know, like recommendations. And we've been working, uh, meeting stakeholders. We've met with Kurt and um, we met with the police officers on the advisory panel a couple of weeks ago, just trying to help get ideas around what are some policy recommendations we can make. And then I had this little um, uh, heading here for possible call out boxes. So I think under success stories or community spotlight, we could you know do a little feature on building livability in New Gloucester. There's a lot happening in gray. We could do, um, you know, kind of highlight the bike ped plan, the police streets policy, the recent master plan. Um, Bridgeton has a, a redesigned main street. Uh, and then Bob, we could have an update on how speed limits are set in Maine, although that would probably go in that speed management section. But anyways, just wanted to open it up to get um, your thoughts on Specifically, I guess that tools and strategies section, if that seems like a reasonable approach. Yeah, that does look reasonable. It's 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 pretty challenging to talk comprehensively about that many towns. So it seems like those are those seem like useful groupings for rural areas. Yeah. Yeah, I struggle a little bit because it's like they overlap a lot in a lot of places. Um, 
and we tried to do this, I think, with the first plan and ended up aborting and just going with uh, that big table because it was too hard to kind of like organize everything. But I think with like using that um, the overarching like framework of like using what we heard in the survey and you know, what are the top concerns that came from the survey, I think will help us kind of get to those those sections. And I'd also like to include more quotes from the survey in the plan. Uh, there's a lot of like really good, powerful um, commentary in there that I think would be good to include. And so that's all I got. I think what we'll do is probably like as sections get done, I think we should probably send them out to you or bring them into that Google folder so you can take a look. Um, so far, the sections have mainly been like introduction and um, not super meaty, but I think when we, like once we get that crash analysis done, we'll add that in there so you can get a sneak peek and put, you know, provide comments. And we'll keep chugging along with this. I think um, next steps for the grant will be, I'll reach out to all the town managers. I'll follow up with you and we'll send out follow-up materials. And we'll just, yeah, keep at it. I don't think I have much else, but yeah, go ahead, Ann. Um, this is Deborah. I just wanted to thank you oh. for the work that you've done on this and the maps. They're really very cool. I look forward to spending some time really exploring those. Great. Yeah. And, yeah, and, if, and if you want to connect with me, I'd love to meet with you sometime at your convenience. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm good. Thanks. I'm gonna. I'll reach out to Mike, and then we'll be in touch. Yeah. Uh, Rick, when when is the when are you trying to get this submitted? Oh, that's a good question. So. On our reporting, we have a draft complete by April 19th, which is maybe a little unrealistic. Um, and then action plan completed by May 31st, adopted by June 21st, officially submitted to FHWA June 28th. But I think that we might, I, I don't want to have this plan go on for another year. So I like I think there is a lot of um, like good. There's a good rationale for you know keep going with it, like get it done. So it's not we're not just sitting on it. Um, but I think maybe another month or two extension from where we're currently at would make sense. And um, Patrick, if you're listening, I I do need to follow up with you on that and talk with. Uh, staff at CACs and kind of, I know you wanted to know know that information in early April, right? So, so if so, and just looking back at the at the grant application deadlines, the uh, the two later ones are May sixteenth and August 29th. So you wouldn't have a completed plan by the May sixteenth deadline, but you should have it by the by the August twenty ninth one. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and, and I, is, is your and to your knowledge, does it matter if if the if the action plan isn't done by the time we would apply if we if we went to go for the earlier deadline, which I don't think we will, honestly. But um, yeah, uh, it really doesn't sound like it, Lucy. You're shaking your head. Yeah, I mean, for the implementation grants, it seems like it would, but if you're applying for the demonstration or supplemental planning, um, it can. There needs to be an action plan in progress, but it can either be in progress or finished. Okay. I Thanks. think it is kind of advantageous that we're working on it now too, because the projects that we come up with, um, we can incorporate those in the plan. So uh, if it's feed feedback signs or you know what whatever the project is in Gray New Gloucester that you'd like to see, like we can. Put that in the plan somewhere um, in one of those like tools and strategies topic areas 
um, put it as a recommendation, like they can speak to each other, it can reinforce your grant proposal. That's what I'm saying. So I think the timing is actually works out pretty well. Okay, well, unless we have uh, anything else, I think we could probably adjourn a little early. We will send a follow up email. Patrick, anything else you'd like to add? No, I think it covered it pretty well, Rick. I'm okay. good. It's not my place to tell you what to do. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming, and um, we'll be in touch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.